I'm in studio with Al Cini. Uh, as you all know, it's a virtual studio, but this is the, the magic of the internet. And uh, it's my pleasure to sit down virtually with Al and kind of reveal uh, the long-term plan and uh, you know some of the strategies for, for brand building uh, that we recommend, that we talk about, um, that we advocate for, for our community. And uh, this is a really interesting and important topic for academics, thought leaders, people putting themselves out there in the industry, uh, specifically on the internet, right? I mean, oh, yeah. what do you, what do you, uh, what do you come across? Do you come do you work with, uh, you know, you, I know you work with people at all entry points, novices, experts. Uh, so what's the initial discovery stage like when you start to, uh, you know, work with someone? The, uh, you know, Daniel, that is, uh, first of all, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. And I love having these kinds of conversations, especially with somebody who thinks a little bit deeply, more than most people do most of the time. Most people think that marketing, personal branding really is kind of an aspect of marketing. Most people think that marketing is about coming up with the kind of a convincing lie that fools other people into buying something from you or into buying you. And, uh, and, and so marketing gets kind of a bad rap because everybody just believes it's a, like hypnosis. So we're trying to hypnotize people with a logo or something like that. It's a, it's a parlor game, but it isn't. Here's what I found. No matter, no matter how you dress, no matter what you say, no matter what you're able to do, even if you're disabled, if you're aligned with your purpose, if you have a strong sense of purpose, then your personal brand will flow from that. And everything about personal branding, at least in my experience, for that matter, corporate branding, is about capturing the purpose that represents a, the difference a company or a person make in the world. And then expressing that purpose out, outwardly, so that you communicate authentically to people, so that they see who you are and what you're about very quickly, so that they immediately can choose, decide where you fit in their lives. Because they're all looking for that. They're all look, Everybody's looking for a way to incorporate you into what they do or, or how they live. And what you want to do is very quickly tell them exactly where that is, what, what it is you can offer, what it is you can add value to. And uh, for me anyway, that's a, the magic of, of, uh, of personal, of branding, whether you're a corporation or a person. We don't draw a distinction between those two. Well, that's, that's really great. It's almost like a snapshot heuristic, right? It's, it's like, I'm going to imprint this on you to say, this is what I am because we, you know, we've all been there. The, we've all been there with the finger scrolls and trying to get impression. Our attention spans are very limited. Uh, there's a lot of information being thrown out there. And yeah, how do you break through that threshold? So I think that's really important. Well, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, for people for people that are watching, maybe listening, I, mostly watching, I guess, so they can see you and me. Uh, I'll just share with you what I, what I saw when I first met you, and that was only a week ago. Uh, you dress in a kind of a casual, almost rustic way, which means you're not a button-down suit and tie kind of a guy. Uh, if I say something to you that you think is crap, you'll immediately feed back to me. I think that's crap, Al. You could do better than that. You're, you're, you're uh, the kind of conversation you want to have, and I, you learn this within the first, and I think it's one of the reasons why we're talking again this week, is it's pretty obvious the kind of conversation you want to have is a deep conversation that explores ideas and not just a superficial conversation that talks about personalities. You're, uh, it's much deeper than gossip. Now, small talk has a role. I mean, it, it, that's how we that's how we communicate with each other casually. I mean, small talk is important. So you talk about sports teams and politics and that kind of small talk sometimes makes people comfortable with each other. But, but your personal brand is, don't tell me what you think I want to hear. Tell me, dive down deep and tell me what you really want to tell me. But think about it first before you open your mouth. And I, I, the way you carry yourself, the way you communicate, the way you dress, all tells me that a conversation with you is going to be a little challenging. Not simple, not super. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and, you, and you, I think you deliver on that. And that, you know, and it's not just blowing smoke, because if you were dressed in a suit and tie, and if you were really careful about how you look, then I know that you would be looking for me to give you something that you felt you could sell to somebody. 
you know, I'd know that. That would change what I told you so that I would give you things that I thought you might be able to sell to somebody. That's a whole different, not necessarily a better or worse kind of a conversation, but it's different. It's a very different kind of conversation. And the kind of conversation you challenge people with is not the kind of conversation everybody's comfortable with. They've got to they got to switch gears to be able to talk to you. And yeah, I think you, your personal brand very much communicates that, for example. Yeah, well, that's good. I mean, uh, you know, the uh, the bucket hat is, is something that <laughs> is very <laughs> casual, but I guess it's, um, yeah, it's... Uh, it, it's, it's deliberate. It's, yeah, it's actually, yeah. It's you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's not something you grab on your way out. I mean, that you thought about that. That tells people something about you. And only 20% of what you say is actually your brand. Uh, the other 80% are all the other things about you. You know, uh, facial hair, you have it. Uh, it's neatly trimmed. You know, you're not a mountain man, exactly. I mean, you, so it's, all those things are things that other people observe and they pick that up, they get to know you and then they give you what they think your brand is trying to draw from them. And, you know, the way I look at you, I know I can't get away with anything. So I can't just tell you something and tell you what the price is and expect that to be enough for you. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, the branding is kind of, um, it transcends both of us, at least even for this uh, particular conversation. So, um, you know, you gracefully agreed to put the uh, the planks of branding on your screen. And uh, it's, it's, that's exactly what it's, in fact, you're the only person that I've actually co-branded this with. And <laughs> so, um, you know, I've got the plank and the planks, I guess, in the image behind you. And I've got this, uh, uh, I guess, um, obscure sort of sky with a cup of coffee or tea and that was the idea the concept of plank set was a an organic platform uh to change how we consume um and so i don't know maybe a little bit in the history of the old coffee houses where the intellects would gather and uh you know potentially solve the world's problems uh, you know, they, this is exercise for the mind, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I. That's the platform, the organic platform that that our members um, they buy into, not, you know, not and, financially necessarily, but they they buy into the concept, right? So, so okay, let's talk a little bit about Plank because uh, after we spoke, actually even before we spoke, I, I took a quick look at the um, at your website, which also was an influence in how I approached our first conversation. Your website, your website is a kind of a beatnik website. Uh, it's um, I, I don't want to say hippie-ish because that's stupid. Uh, it, it is a um, off-center, unusual thinking. There's something down deep inside your brain. We want you before you open your mouth to dig a little deep, find it, and then express it to us. Don't just blather. Uh, it's very artistic. It's uh, but it's abstract art for the most part. A lot of it is. So it's impressionistic kind of kind of communication that tells me that plank sip is about thought it's not about facts it's not about evidence necessarily it's about wisdom so that whole idea that you can take a conversation that includes facts and elevate it to a stage where people really feel like they learn something from it not just something to memorize but something that changes them uh, i think comes through in the, in the way you organize your website so i looked at the website got on the phone with you i pretty much knew what to expect from the conversation. Yeah, you're re you're really great because what I, and I think this was the, um, uh, the reason why I had the follow-up meeting with you in terms of this video was because I thought Al is really good. He's got very um, attuned sense of analytics and assessment here. Uh, his assessment on Plank Sip was pretty much bang on. And at least for the the first impression that we wanted to give, and uh, yeah, highly visual. Uh, it is academic. It caters to the academic and layman alike, but in the areas of philosophy and culture, right? Yeah. And so we find that the conversations that we engage with uh, are exactly in that sector. The membership that's growing is in that sector, and. That's where I want to get you involved. Now we haven't, you know, and, and in the in the spirit of a organic kind of conversation, uh -huh. um, I'd like to get you involved more in the in the plank sip uh, community. And I think that your um, your expertise on brand building uh, somehow, and I don't I don't have anything prescriptive for it yet, 
but you've got the expertise to have the conversations with the, uh, our members to help them brand build, I think. Well, or, you know, okay, now that we've headed down that, first of all, thank you that were, they were, they were kind <laughs> words. I appreciate that. Uh, but second of all, you, you mentioned philosophy and culture as though they were two different things. And that, that's not a mistake. Those are two different words, obviously. And they can be interpreted differently, but they're really very synonymous. The, the way the uh, philosophical pursuit, I mean, what a lot of people remember from uh, college, probably not high school, but college, was a class they would cut about half the time to go bowling or, or play paintball. And they would remember enough about it to be able to pass the exams. And that was pretty much dates and names and one or two sound bites about what a philosopher, a particular philosopher stood for. Just enough to get a B, which is how most people look at philosophy. I mean, it's something I had to do. It was a required course. But philosophy is, uh, at its core, systems for managing reality and coping with reality and dealing with reality and crafting it and changing it. So a philosophical outlook on things is very much wired into the way you interact with all the reality that you perceive around you. It's very practical. It's more tactical than esoteric, really. It just, it, it tends to be presented in an esoteric way, which kind of kills it when you take it in school. You, you, I'm, I'm sure you're understanding what I'm saying. So. Yeah. So what are so how does that relate to culture? And let's talk about that from because for me that's a lot of fun. If you take any group of people that has any purpose in common, and they could be the Gambino crime family, they could be a nursing unit at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, they could be the particle research lab in Geneva, uh, where they look for the Higgs boson. Or they could be Six Flags, an amusement park. And these happen to be organizations that I, I haven't worked with the Gambino crime family directly. But I have worked with law enforcement agencies, people who have dealt with the Gambino crime family. And every one of them has a brand and a culture that is particularly aligned with the purpose that they serve. So forgetting what they sell themselves by or what they advertise themselves as, who they are when they're together as a group, who they become when they align themselves with each other is a function of the purpose they serve. And that is at its core, never use the word philosophy in any marketing material because that scares people, but it's pure applied philosophy, absolutely pure applied philosophy. What is our purpose here in this conversation? What are we trying to accomplish in the world at large with what we do? Those purpose questions are, there are brand, because brand is what you do when you're aligned with your purpose. It's what other people can see. It's the kind of things you say and the way you talk. Uh, and our culture is how we feel about that brand. That's what motivates us to keep behaving that way. What is it about me talking to you that feeds back to me as a motivator to make me want to keep talking and exploring with you? So brand and culture really are, are kind of a dynamic system and maybe in the middle of it, there's this philosophical idea known as purpose. Uh, but commercially, what, what, I've, what I'm doing these days is helping organizations, and that could be two people, it could be a thousand people, find the purpose in the work they do together so that they can align their brand, which is their behavior, and their culture, which is what motivates them, with that purpose in a way that brings joy into their work life. You know, that's so well rounded and encapsulated. Um, you know, I, I want to make a few points. There's my mind goes to a distinction of culture that's more generational, at least from a, um, a you know, a transmission standpoint, you know, something that, that transmits values. I think there's a, an example of a microcosm of culture that that does exist. And is it, uh, I guess, like a some sort of a mimesis or a copy uh, between a larger uh, framework of culture and the the culture of organizations. Mm -hmm. I'm, I know what you're saying. I, I agree with you. The language, it's maybe a limit of the language because culture, culture, at least the research that we're doing um, is on uh, topics like cultural evolution, right? So the, these are, these are descendant based um, transmissions. Uh, you know, so my kids passed down to your kid, these, and this is, so when you have a company that says we want to define a culture, huh. um, I think it's a it's 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 different, but we don't quite have a word that separates the two in terms of like a generational culture and an institutional culture. 
you, you know, I am, I'm, I'm really glad you took the conversation in that direction, Daniel, for, uh, for a couple of reasons. You, you know that expression, uh, in my job, I wear a lot of different hats, that expression. You know, a guy wearing a hat so you can appreciate that, right? Uh, a hat, that concept of a hat is really kind of an expression of culture, whatever that is. So when, when you move from one role to another role in your day, not just in your, in the, within your generation, when you switch from being, let's say, a police officer during the day to coaching a little league baseball team uh, on a weekend, let's say, or in the evening, when you make that switch, what you're really doing is, is switching purposes. My purpose as a police officer when I'm one of these guys is different from my purpose as a coach for the little league team that I work with. And, uh, you know, that ability for people to flex cultures, to adapt to whatever's expected of them, really kind of defines who they are in the moment, not who they are all over the throughout their lives. I mean, you'll, you'll, everybody has a personality and a lot of it is born and some of it is learned. But people are way more flexible than just generational or just national. People can move from one context to another context amazingly quickly if they just understand the purpose that they're switching to from the one they're currently in. If, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I, I totally yeah. agree. You, you know, you kind of you bridge something really nicely on a concept here. The Little League baseball coach is an example of that. OK. And, and, it, and, and at, at first glance, you might say, well, this this isn't anything that's transmitted through generations. But I mean, au contraire, mon frere. <laughs> so it's uh, the, the thing is, is that when I when I inhabit that idea of what a, a Little League coach is, I'm at the same time remembering what it was like to be, you know, the little guy at bat trying Being to take coach, right? this is a part point. of that American Canadian North American culture. Sure. You know, just like soccer is in, in Europe, right? It's just, uh -huh. this is, so sports do that. They fill in that kind of function. But after the sport event, like you said, the person uh, might go into a law enforcement uh, occupation. Yeah. And, you know, the cultural underpinnings of, of law enforcement really have to do with, um, uh well, the, 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 the ethics and the laws of, of, of our society that maintain, you know, order, yeah. right? Yeah, partly. And, uh, but, and but, but that's, but that's evolving yeah. too. I mean, the, the times are, are forcing that to evolve a little bit. And in some of the law enforcement organizations that we're working with, we're finding that, um, let's see, I want to wheel this back to something you said that I thought was really uh, very profound. There is a time-honored, multi-generational tradition called baseball. Little League is a part of that. There is a time-honored, multi-generational uh, occupation called law enforcement. Police departments are kind of a part of that. So you're absolutely right. There is a cultural thread that spans generations that, that is really handing down the purpose of baseball to some to a new generation so that they can pick it up and conserve and and grow that purpose, if that makes sense. So I pass the purpose of being a baseball player on to younger baseball players. But and then they change around the idea that now I've kind of passed the baton to them and they need to run the race now. And so so the expectations of that purpose definitely shape us. No question about that. And some of those expectations go back hundreds of years. But at the same time, they evolve. And I'll give you give you kind of an example. We, we've worked with several police departments now because word of mouth got us additional business. And what we do in, in our occupation, in our, in our work, is we work with organizations to help them clearly identify and understand and get to know their purpose. The way we do it differently is by taking their purpose and turning it into a role model. So for this police department, not police in general, but for this particular police department, we answer the question, what would Jesus do? But it's not Jesus. It's if we were all the police officer that we all aspired to be, that better version of ourselves, what would that person be like? And it's not the chief and it's not the guy who just joined the force yesterday. It's an amalgam of what they all believe and what they all what they what they all love and what they all fear. All that kind of comes together. Right. When we work with those people and we talk to them, the first conversations out of their mouths involve the gun and the badge because those are the trappings of what they do. 
But as you as you become more philosophical about it, as you deepen that conversation, they really start to think about it. Then other other topics start to come up that are actually deeper and much more important. Serving the community, helping people. Why did you become a police officer? Did you become a police officer so you can hang a gun on your hip? Is that really why you became a cop? Well, some of them will say yes, but they don't mean it. They really all wanted to be a police officer because they wanted to, to they like the idea that they'd be able to help people in a certain way. That's how they see it. So when you work with the police department, our work with the police department is about getting them to realize that their purpose is service and that when they approach somebody, maybe think about putting your hand somewhere else other than on your gun. Because cops are typically trained to have their hands on a gun to be ready for anything. And that's typical drill type training. But if you're a police officer and you're really good at what you do, then you know enough about the person you're approaching because you've already looked them up on your computer in your car. You know enough about the person you're approaching to be able to assess the threat pretty reliably up front. When you know that you're approaching somebody who doesn't pose a threat, then why approach them in a threatening way? Mm. You follow me? Because if yeah. I walk you and, I, and and these are by the way the behaviors they come back to us with. You know, I could smile when I look inside somebody's car. I don't have to be a police officer. I can just say I could ask if they're having a problem. I could ask if I can help in some way. I could remind them what they did. I might have to write them a ticket. I might have to get them to smile about that, you know, but that whole encounter could be something that could be more service oriented and less enforcement oriented. Now, when we know what Jesus would do, again, it's not really Jesus. This is not this is not just for Christians. Anybody of any faith can do this or no faith at all. When we know what that ideal self is, when we have a good picture of that in our head, then we can start to emulate that. You eliminate um you start addressing a lot of the fundamentals that you need to address to be a more effective department. Does that make sense? Oh, I mean, absolutely. The 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 Jesus heuristic is something that that you know, I've I've written about and spoken about um because you're absolutely right the way you've been able to encapsulate that and make it consilient for an entire in an, an entire culture, right? Is that um, you know, Christian uh I don't know, maybe a Muslim uh, tradition might get a little bit apprehensive with that 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 sort of thing, but we can say the ideal man, right? Yeah. And you know, or or woman, right? Or, you totally. Know, the ideal person. What would the ideal person do in that particular situation? In this and, particular case, and that becomes the personified version of our culture. Exactly. Right? We are. That's this is who we are. You see that person? I know that person. I met that person. If I were to go to a party, I'd recognize that person based on the way they look, based on the way they behave. When you get to know that person really well and then you start making a list and we we walk people through this process. What two or three things about yourself do you think beginning tomorrow morning you can do a little differently to be more like that person and less like the kind of unintentional person you already are that you're currently that you're currently being. And I don't care whether you're a nurse at a hospital or a particle physicist or uh working at Six Flags the amusement park or a police officer. The culture, the purpose of the organization defines cultural expectations and creates a role model for you that you could be more like, somebody that could inspire you and that's why I mean our tagline is it's brand and culture alignment toolkit and underneath that we call it align and inspire because it is not a sign and require which is how most leadership works most mm -hmm. leadership is you will do this this is something you will do around here in which case you set up a defense reaction now all of a sudden people want to distance themselves from the purpose they don't want anything to do with the purpose because you just tried to force it on them and you can't do that to people it's like an arranged marriage in a lot of ways well let me let me run this by you too because um i think that the you know there may be very little uh, assimilation of culture that has to happen with the with the plank sit group i'm just exploring an idea here but sure. if i talk to a professor that professor's culture his outlook and his desire to stay objective even within the plank sit community is something that i think uh they can achieve because their 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 over their overarching culture is actually one of I'm a teacher I'm a facilitator I've got my research I've you know and so they fall in that tradition of educator mm -hmm. right and so 
what we do, I think what PlankSip is doing is supporting that. And actually, we're supporting an individuality, right? We're supporting the fact that it's not about the PlankSip brand. It's about the individual brand of the thought leader, right? And so we actually, um, you know, it's almost an absence of which is the which is the brand which is the purpose is sure. to not draw attention to our purpose because it's their purpose you know like uh -huh. does that make sense i mean i know it, it doesn't it does but but it is a purpose in itself in a way it's uh, kind of like the purpose of an incubator is to uh, uh hatch a chick i mean the purpose of, so in a, in a way what you're describing for me is plank sip is a kind of a thought incubator uh yeah a, group of people who get together on a on some basis to communicate with each other yeah and the, the 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 goal there is to allow everybody to express their thoughts on whatever matters to them so all the individual individual individuality is there but plank sip itself is something i yeah. mean it's it, it plank sip supports all that so so what is plank sip plank sip is a place where i know i can say what i feel and i know that even though if i were dealing with you as an academic in your natural setting in college, you might laugh your butt off at what I just said. I know that at Plank Zip, you won't. Because when you're in Plank Zip, we don't laugh at each other. When you're in Plank Zip, we don't overly criticize each other. We challenge each other, but we don't nitpick. At Plank Zip, we listen to you. you. You follow me? So you've got a purpose. There's a purpose underneath that, even if it is to support other people's purpose. Yeah, well, let me explain maybe because I, I mean, I'm a very, uh, very much an advocate of the academic uh, tradition and, and uh, you know, critique. It's how we it's one of the mechanisms to move um, and, and uh, move knowledge forward. Right. It's 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 ways for personal growth. Like if I said, Al, you know what? I really like the way you've you know, you've set up your website, but this may not work because of this. I'm not I'm not the sole authority on it, but you could come back and go, that's very valid criticism, right? So this criticism, the criticism that happens, you know, within groups, um, I'll give you an example. So we have a, uh, a peer review um, procedure for submissions of, of articles. And so they're actually mm -hmm. competitions and our board does not choose who wins the competitions, right? It actually goes out to a selection process of people that are actually writing. And so the aggregate of the winning uh, article actually mm -hmm. comes from uh, the community, right? From everybody, right? Yeah, from everybody, right? right? And so it's it's what article do they think is the is the best? And I I try and coach or urge people uh, uh, that I try and move them down this direction. And the direction is is that when someone's writing or creating on Plank Sip, they're creating first and foremost for themselves. Um, and that idea of incubator is a really good idea because we want to lift the veil that is sometimes forced upon thought leaders that they can't experiment or, you know, if you have to write an essay in a more traditional uh, university setting, hey, this is something where you could, you know, possibly write aphorisms or write a, uh, a poem as an entry like there's mm -hmm. there's there's a lot less guidelines and rules and rubrics that will limit the creative expression of our members that being said the um the, the core of what you're trying to transmit is something that all of the group can understand where there's value right so if i sure. made a submission and i made, wrote a poem and it called uh -huh. for 500 to a thousand word submission and i wrote a four line poem um, there's no rule against that, but you better have pulled that off. Those <laughs> right? better be, well, hey, let, let me, I, I think that's great. I'll feed that back to you. Uh, when I was referring to criticism, I, uh, I was the, the platonic Aristotelian kind of criticism where you question somebody's thinking is okay, but derision isn't. So, so if you, if somebody submits something and you just post and you post it, you take it, you hang it up there someplace where everybody can see it. And you put a comment underneath like, what are you, three? What, did the three-year-old write this? Who wrote this? Did your cat write this? <laughs> yeah. that, you know, we've just crossed the line away from, we're not being constructive anymore. Now all we're doing is saying how much better we are than you are, if you know what I mean. So that idea that somehow in Plank Zip, we challenge each other, but we do it with a certain amount of mutual respect and care. And 
Also, by the way, Planksip is a by invitation kind of a community. At least that's the impression I get. You don't just let anybody in. Well, it's in a way, yes. But I don't know if I've told you this, but we actually support um, writers and authors from all around the world. This is a program that most people don't know about. Uh-huh. And so the uh, it's part of our, our mentorship program and it's open to writers all, all over the world, like I said. And so even with people who have, I mean, especially with people that don't have English as a first language. Mm. Now, what happens is, is that we've, in our CMS, which is the back end of our publishing entity, we have the ability for them to make contributions to the site, uh, and it's a soft publish. So it doesn't show up published on the site in terms mm-hmm. of, um, you know, somebody goes to PlankSip and they can see it. Mm-hmm. It's a URL that they can go to um, so that if there's, say, somebody from India or, uh, you know, Shanghai and they're trying to better their English and, you know, hone their skills and develop themselves in the English language, um, they, they actually can take that URL and then share that amongst their friends. So there's a graduated process of, of, of quality where the, the, the real, real entry people, uh, you know, in terms of, of, of written expression, do have an outlet, right? So it's a, you know, very deliberate to try and make it inclusive for everybody so it's not as exclusive of it may, as it may seem. I think the reason why it gives that impression is because there's a lot of, um, you know, high quality writing on the site. There's a lot of um, essays from you know, PhD philosophers and thought leaders. Mm-hmm. So, of course, we do showcase and feature a lot of that. Um, but yeah, I think just recently I took and I, I put on the front page, uh, you know, a, a, an article uh, about love from, a, 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 you know, was it a, I don't, what do I want to call her? I, a junior writer, but I'm not, I just did because what comes up in my head. She's a very new member, but I thought, wow, this is really good. Um, and, you know, it it was personal and she she did a good job. And so, you know, we 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 posted it right so that when you visit PlankSip, you can see it. Now, of course, we're a publishing, a publishing cycle, so we kind of move things along and it may have only been in existence and visible on PlankSip.org from, sure. you know, the you know, the beginning of the summer and then it sorts to, you know, starts to, you know, a timestamp pushes it further down the list. But, you know, we are actually more inclusive than um, than uh, it may seem. And that's sometimes hard to convey, right? Like you want to convey high quality, but you want right. to stay open air. It's been a very challenge. It's it's, it looks- well, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, what, what you want, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not a member of the community yet. I'm kind of looking forward to learning more about it. I think it could be a lot of, well, I'm going to say a lot of fun. For, this is fun for me because I like these kinds of conversations. But, but you're, what you're, what you're telling me is that if I become a member, you want my best. You don't want me to just dash off something. What you, what, what I'd be doing is contributing to a community of people who will, I don't want to say peer review because that sounds very judgmental. We're going to be, I'm going to be developing an idea. We're going to be working on it collaboratively, uh, bringing other people into the conversation when I feel comfortable. Their thoughts will be brought to me, and then I will rework what I'm doing. And maybe not. Um, there could be some suggestions that I just sort of shove aside, and there could be others I embrace. And the goal is to come up with a good quality product when it's all finished that you feel you can feature in your front page. That's a yeah, problem. I should, I should, I should clarify. There's, um, there was somebody that we had on recently that um, he, he had a tagline in business about being different or being dead, right? He's kind of abrasive this way, but he's got a business uh, mentality. And so um, his name's Roy Osing. And so we just started recently working with him. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, he, uh, he, he had mentioned that this idea of, of differentiation, being different, being unique, these, these kinds of things mm-hmm. as a way to success in businesses and organizations to compete mm-hmm. out in a marketplace, right? <clears throat> So the important thing I think that differentiates us when we bring on new members um, is that we try and have interviews with, um, it's impossible for us to have personal one-on-one interviews with every single um, student in the practicum that we work with. So there's more of an intake process. 
Mm-hmm. And that intake process is something where they participate in our writing programs, right? To develop the writing. Now, Al, your situation is different because you are an existing thought leader in your community. And you might say, hey, look, I don't want to spend time reading and trying peer reviews and try and win competition. This is more for the people trying to develop, right? Like in that, in, in, the, um, in the writer's cooperative. Right. Our situation, if we were going to do something with Al as a member, then what I'm trying to do is develop Al within the community so he's a res- resource that that people can go to for brand building. That's number one inside of our community. Outside of our community, you have to see enough value for you to say, one of the places that I exist in the Planksip community, and when that video goes out, Ah, I like that. I like that the next time I go into the law enforcement uh, presentation, that if they consult the Google Oracle and they see that Al did a presentation or a video with Daniel, they're like, yeah, this is this that serves the purpose, right? That purpose Mm -hmm. is not antithetical. It actually should provide you with more depth into those conversations with it, you're not only the law enforcement agencies, and I want to spend some more time on it because I actually have a very specific cultural question that I want to ask you, sure. or any of the other kinds of clients that you have, including the mafia families that you said that you work with on a regular basis, right? So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> First of all, we don't like to call them mafia family. Second of all, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, they don't like that. <laughs> so, um, okay, so... What my question is, is that now now we're getting into something like a cultural commentary and what is going on with this idea of defunding the police and what what is this what is this nonsense that's that's oh, that's yeah. kind of going on. Is, was that the specific cultural question that you had in mind? Yes, I, I, I just it, I really, really, really love that question. And I'm gonna answer it two ways. I'll, I'll answer it factually the first way. I don't know whether I mentioned in my last conversation that I worked for fifteen years at NBC Universal. But I wow. did. Okay. And part of the work that I did at NBC Universal included audience analysis and audience research. My background actually is social side. So uh, you, you're probably too young to remember this, but your parents might remember something we used to call must see TV. That was uh, the, the, the reality that the national broadcasting company owned Thursday nights on television. So culture is ultimately a motivator and their job with their with must see tv was to motivate 39 million or 40 million people to put aside whatever they might have otherwise planned to do on that thursday night to be in front of their television sets at nine o'clock when their shows came on they were very successful at that i mean that's kind of like a cultural thing so that said understand that particular application of culture is about segmenting the marketplace so when we talk about defunding the police, and the amusing thing about all this is, there are two camps that have emerged in the United States, uh, and uh, largely because it suits the political purposes of the two political parties in the United States. One camp is oriented toward maintaining order and discipline and uh, eliminating chaos. The other camp is oriented toward evolving the systems that we depend on so that they are more inclusive and more representative of our population, right? Because candidates represent those two and because candidates win by defeating other candidates, there is a need to segment the market into people who think one way or the other. So when you you see defund the police, it is an observed fact that 90% of the defund the police placements of headlines are on Fox News, not on CNN. Because Fox News is drawing an audience of that first group, the people who want to kind of preserve things. The way they glue that audience to their broadcasting is by reminding them constantly that the enemy is out there as they perceive it. And they do that by reporting on the enemy. Hmm. And now CNN, while Donald Trump was president, had a field day. And Trump is fertile territory for, for the other side. CNN had a field day reminding everybody about Donald Trump and what Donald Trump is like. They were very effective at gluing their audience, which is ultimately all you want. You want people to watch your stuff, right? All the all the anti-Trump stuff came from CNN, not from Fox News. And that was how they glued their audience together. So defund the police is not so much a cultural phenomenon 
as it is an accident of um, screwed up advertising. It's a screwed up advertising message that's not aimed at getting you to buy something. It's aimed at getting you to hate something because hate is a motivator and you can glue eyeballs to television screens with that. That is, I think, a direction that we've headed in that I, is so toxic, I can't even begin to describe it. But it's got, it requires self-governance and they're just not up to it. The two sides of the argument are just not up to it. They can't help themselves. That's how bad it's gotten. This goes exactly. I love how you've brought this to a point, and there's some real skill behind how you how you bring your points together. And so, the way I see it is that in our opening part of our conversation, you talk about branding and aligning purpose, right? Mm -hmm. And so, there's something completely antithetical with that statement of defund the police because of the fact that underneath the, the purpose or the purpose. Um, of um, uh, drawing attention to the, 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 the issues in the police force, um, the answer of defunding it or destructuring it or bringing it down uh, does much less to, to actually solve a problem, right? It's, it's this revolutionary tear it down and build it up again mentality that's the that's what that's what the the media you know I, I really hate to blame it on the media having worked there for as long as i did but but the media is based on segmenting markets so that you watch one network over another i mean that's the basic right. dynamics they make decisions all the time based on that sometimes a really poor decision and uh, even from a business point of view because if you look at cnn's ratings these days by being successful at tearing down Donald Trump, they've actually torn themselves down because their ratings are off 70% mm -hmm. from what they were back when they had Donald Trump to kick around. In a way, they've actually kind of hurt themselves, weirdly, uh, by, by doing what they did. If they had to think it over again, maybe they would have done it a little differently. Maybe they wouldn't have been quite so good at it. Uh, but, but that whole idea that you want to get people riled up is almost like a misrepresentation of brand. Uh, let, let, let me let me explain what I learned because this is this goes to something that I think is really critical. We have a particular process for discovering purpose inside a group. So let's imagine we were using our pro process in Planksip. So we would take a group of people who represented Planksip. They could have been new people or old people or young people or uh, they could be there for a long time. They could be a founder. They could be anybody. But mm. you take a group of people who are a member of the, uh, members of the community and you ask them this question. This is so powerful. Uh, this is one of the most powerful things we do in our work and we give it away. Think about all of Planksip as though it were a single person doing its best work on its best day to keep all its promises and achieve all its goals. Get that picture in your head. Planksip is somebody I could meet at a party. Part of him might look like Daniel. Part of her might look like somebody else. You know, I don't know whether I see a man or a woman there. Yeah. Those differences are all valuable. You want everybody's voice in that answer. You want uh, uh, everybody's point of view. What we have is a system that boils that all down and tells us what the role model looks like collectively. What do we all see planks it when he or she is doing his or her best work on her best day? Mm. And uh, that's the beginning of our method. Now, about three years ago, Actually, four years ago, we sent out our survey. We have a survey system for measuring that. We sent out our survey to about 1,100 people. And we asked them, think about all of the United States as though we're a single person doing its best work on its best day to keep all of its promises and achieve all its goals. We worked pretty hard at getting that out there to Northerners, Southerners, young people, old people. And in addition to our usual survey, which is answering the direct question, we also added some demographics. Do you consider yourself to be wealthy? Are you a Repo conservative or a liberal? Are you a member of a political party? Which one? That kind of thing. And what we got back were two people. We got about 740 responses, I think, finally. We collected it over a couple of months. They drew two pictures. Hmm. One picture is of somebody who cares deeply about other people and community and mutual support but likes to enjoy themselves and have a good time. Hmm. Okay. The other picture we got back was somebody who cares deeply about community and likes to support and help other people and, and know that there's support out there when they're, when they need it. And, but number two, cross your T's, dot your I's, take care of business, keep your lawn clean, keep your house clean. The only difference we found was that around the age 43, 44, we shifted from, it's always about community, but we shifted from having a good time when we're younger 
to taking care of business when we're older. That's the only difference we found. Republicans, Democrats, young, old, those are, we got two role models back. So you tell me what the culture is of the United States. I can feed that back to you based on what I learned. Has nothing to do with any of the crap we see in newspapers or on online or in Facebook or it has nothing to do with any of that. The way people want to live their lives yeah. is extremely similar across the entire spectrum of politics. And unfortunately, that's good news and good news doesn't sell newspapers. Yeah. So, so you can't get that out there. It's a shame. I'd much rather get people pissed off about defunding the police and uh, uh, whatever the issue is. Well, then we need to really advocate for that. I mean, I, I don't know if you were uh, familiar with um, Yang, but he ran for Andrew Yang. Yan, ran oh, sure. for Yeah. So he ran for mayor. I'm from New York. So, yeah. yeah. What was your thoughts about him? I mean, he's very unique. To, he was almost trying to disrupt the the you know the political status quo for sure. I mean, at least, at least for red and blue. He's he's a creative scientist, and Andy Yang is. You can tell he's data driven, and he you know that's kind of a passion of his. Right. But he's kind of creative, outside the box thinking kind of a mind, um, which may not be so sellable from the point of view of uh, politics, because uh, the political the political battle in New York was was wrapped around: uh, Are we going to be status quo or are we going to be counterculture? Pretty much. Mm -hmm. And Andy, unfortunately, I think kind of turns up in the middle somewhere where people don't feel particularly riled up by him one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we have is a current mayor, Bill de Blasio, who's a little bit of a clown, maybe, and kind of silly, but very uh, liberal. Mm -hmm. And we had some candidates who are now running as a counterweight to him, saying mm -hmm. we got to get back to basics. We have to clean up the streets. We have to attack, uh, address the crime issue. So, uh, so that pendulum swing is, I think, a kind of a perpetual thing. And that yeah. might be just the nature of politics. So I, I feel sorry for Andy because he might have been right in the middle of where the pendulum stops instead of on either end, which is where people vote. That's where people vote. But the centrists are, you know, becoming more and more homeless until it polarizes and gets yeah. common sense on those ends. We're kind of, uh, you know, we're kind of run uh, in both political systems, uh, Canada yeah. and the U.S., the world probably is is a little bit in this phenomenon of, of uh, you know, being held, uh, you know, captive by the tyranny of the majority and a little bit of Stockholm syndrome, yeah. right? A lot of it. I mean, if you want to know what uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez is up to, you don't go to CNN to learn about that. You go to Fox. Yeah. Even though, because Fox is always portraying her as you can't believe what she said today. You can't believe what she said yesterday. You can't believe what she said about Israel. You won't believe what she said about the police. They love that stuff. It's clickbait for their audience. And and you go to see her, they hardly ever mention her. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know what? We're coming in on the top of the first hour or the top of the hour for our first show. Um, we had no definitive plans whether we wanted to keep this as an ongoing basis. But, you know, Al, I'll give you an open invitation and I'll have you back any time if you want to make this something regular. Uh, sure, you know. I'd love to do this. This is a fun conversation for me to have. And, and maybe every now and then with a third party on the on the call to talk about what they do. Yeah, uh, you know, as it relates to some of the issues we discussed, it'd be fun. I'd love to do that. And I really appreciate the invitation, Dan. Daniel. Thanks for having me on today. Okay. Al, stay healthy. Uh, this week is like the, the, the heat is bearing down on, on our... Uh, before here. <laughs> yeah, so, so stay safe, stay cool. And uh, until next time, Al, I really, really appreciate your time. Total, total pleasure for me. Thanks, Daniel. Okay.